hello, hello, and welcome to episode five of Blah Blah Black Sheep, a weekly podcast where I answer your questions and talk about all things yarny going on in my life. I have so been enjoying this, so thank you so much for joining me here today. I am Sarah Korp of SEK Handmade. Oh my goodness, it is so bright and sunny outside. <laughs> it's confusing my camera a little bit, so I apologize if that happens. Um, I normally share with you what I'm wearing, um, but, <laughs> and I'm going to, but my poppy shawl just released last week, and so I thought it would be fun to um, not only share it with you, which I shared last week too, I know, um, but show you how one, one of the ways I love to wear a bigger shawl like this. This is a very traditional, like, uh, triangle-ish size shawl, but it's not a triangle shape. You can see it doesn't come straight across the top. It comes up and then wraps around into this little, uh, like, swirl, heart, half moon, crescent moon shape, kind of, um, which I love. I think it makes it super wearable because this shape naturally wraps around. So here is what I do to uh, wear a shawl like this. I put the uh, point in the center and then I only wrap one side at a time. I think a mistake a lot of people do is they just kind of like do this and then you end up, especially, I don't know, I am uh, short-ish, um, barely 5'3". <laughs> And so like a bunch, like having a bunch of just bulk around here is just like, I don't know, it's uncomfortable. It looks awkward. It accentuates the fact that I'm shorter than average. <laughs> so here's what I like to do. I put the point in the middle and then I very carefully wrap my side so that it's flat, as flat as can be, right? So it's not all just thrown and bunched up. It's nice and flat around my shoulder. Then, actually, I'm gonna go ahead right now and I'm gonna leave this on the outside. Then I'm gonna carefully wrap this side as well, keeping it nice and flat and bring it around my other shoulder. And then you can see I've got kind of a shorter end and a longer end kind of off to the side here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the longer end over and around the shorter end, just a simple you know, not here. And then, ta-da! Now you can see this comes all the way to my lap because I'm such a petite person. And then you can kind of zhuzh the neck if you feel like it's a little, a little much. Let's see, what does this look like from behind? Like a nice little crossover then of the, the border here, which is like really what you want to show off and highlight, right? So, and then you can see it comes um, to my, below my waist, here's my waist, below my waist, um, because I am so petite, <laughs> but that's one of the ways I love to wear uh, a shawl like this that keeps it nice and open and really shows off the, um, oh my gosh, the stitches <laughs> in the shawl um, as well as keeping it from being like super tight around my neck. See, it's not super tight. It just curves really nicely. And then that little, um, twist there really helps it stay put. So that's one of my favorite ways to wear a shawl like this right now when it's still chilly outside. Um, when it gets more summery, I like loosen it up and drape it more so that it's not even as close to my neck as it is now. So, this is the poppy shawl. It is available now. I'll put links in the show notes below. Please check it out. I would love it if you would. Um, I am going, you guys, I'm going to be doing, I need to, I need to, <laughs> I will do several uh, tester calls. So if you are a pattern tester or you have thought about pattern testing, I'm also going to link in the show notes, a link to my pattern testing email list um, so that you can join that if you would like to um, to test any of my patterns coming up. Um, last, last week, no, well, 
sure, let's start with last week. Last week I showed you the sister shawl, uh, the Zoe shawl, sister to Poppy. Um, she's out to testers. Um, we're going to be out to testers very shortly. So that one's kind of off the table. But I told you a couple weeks ago about how figuring out this uh, cool technique like brought me so much joy. And my friends, I've made two of them now. It's a shaping technique for a cowl. I've made two of them. And I am even more obsessed with the second one than I was with the first one. And uh, so if you want to test that, though I need to be getting testers for that ASAP. So uh, join the tester email list and, and then you'll get notifications whenever I need testers for things. If you're like, what the heck is that pattern testing thing you talk about or that I've heard around? Um, I have a whole playlist about what is pattern testing, how to become a pattern tester, things that you do when you're a pattern tester. I will link that in the show notes as well as I have some Meet the Maker interviews with people who, um, I'm going to call them professional pattern testers. Uh, they don't get paid for their pattern testing as far as I know, but they have pattern tested a lot. So I did a fun Meet the Maker series. Um, I think I have three of them in there. Um, with pattern testers to talk about like, why do they pattern test? What's their favorite thing? Do they have tips? It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So if you don't know what pattern testing is, I highly recommend that you check that out because um, it's a really uh, neat way to use your skills and lots of people really enjoy it. So also in one of the videos, um, I think I talk about, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> for sure talk about like how to decide if pattern testing is right for you or not, because that's important. It can be stressful and you don't want, you don't want your crafting to be stressful. So my friends, the thing that is bringing me so much joy right now is right out my window. Sunshine. Oh my goodness. Um, it's been a bit, a little hit or miss, but I feel like we're really turning the corner to spring when it's sunny out and, oh, the snow is melting. We've had some warm temperatures. I have not been taking as much advantage of it as I should, but it is sunny out and, and I'm doing it. I'm going for a walk today, a nice long walk in the sunshine. Here's the other trick. <laughs> Lately, what's been happening is it'll be sunny um, like t through midday and then it'll get like cloudy, like the weather will shift a little bit. And I, I, I always put it off. I'm like, I will go walk. I'll go early to pick the boys up to school from school and I'll walk, um, when I go pick them up. And then by the time it's time to go pick them up, it's rainy or just cloudy and cold. And then I'm like, that's no fun. I'm not going to go. <laughs> So we really need to take advantage of the weather being nice now and get out and get a walk in and then come back and do the things I need to do. So I'm committing. I'm going to do it today. Uh, feeling the sunshine on my face. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I love a good pair of sunglasses. <laughs> I read somewhere that the lighter the color of your eye, the more sensitive you are to um, sun. And I have blue eyes and um so I'm pretty sensitive to the sunshine uh so mm, love me a good pair of sunglasses <laughs> so I need to get out there with my sunglasses and just feel the sunshine on my face breathe in the fresh air I highly recommend you do it too I for the month of February I told myself I was going to get out and walk I was going to be outside for 30 minutes a day. Now, in February in Wisconsin, you got to be moving for the most part because <laughs> it's really cold. So, but I didn't want to pressure myself that I'm going to speed walk for 30 minutes or I'm going to whatever. I mean, there were times that I was trudging through a foot of snow to get out and walk. Um, and, but then I also felt like there wasn't the pressure to like have my heart rate up all the time. And I really took some time to just like walk 
through, there's a cemetery uh, across the way from us and a lot of animals hang out there. It's right by the river. And I saw hawks and bald eagles and deer. And I think I saw a turkey or two. It was so cool to and peaceful. There were a few times that it was just snowing. It was lovely. I enjoyed it so much and I'm kicking myself for not having done more of it this month. It's good for my sleep to get out and move like that. It's good for my brain and my mood and, and all the things. It's just good for me, so I need to do it. So bug me about it. Ask me if I've gone for a walk today. <laughs> um, because I need to. It's just good for me. And it's good for you too, so I encourage you to do it too. It doesn't always have to be pleasant. There were times I like froze my boogers off. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, productive. Like you don't need to have your heart rate up. You don't need to like it just the fresh air is what's good for us. So highly, highly recommend. So thing that's bringing me joy, sunshine. Yay. All right. I want to share a couple small businesses with you. Um, you're going <laughs> to, I feel a little silly about this, but here's the thing. This this was all always meant to be casual, not super planned, not like, um, just casual and conversational. And so, um, I'm not going to try to get dressed up every time, dressed up, you know, like when I teach a class, I try to look very professional dressed up. I'm probably going to be in jeans most of the time or leggings and sweatshirts and stuff or t-shirts when it's summer. I have some fun ones with funny sayings on them. That'll be good for summer. <laughs> um, but I'm not, I'm not thinking too hard about it. Um, and in the spirit of not thinking too hard about it, um, I don't have a new mug to show you because A, I don't have an endless supply of handmade mugs and B, I use them uh, every day and they get dirty. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't do dishes every night. I'm a person who can walk away from dirty dishes and be like, yeah, that's a tomorrow thing doesn't bother me. I sleep just fine. So I again have my cheeky ceramics mug with me that says I need a huge amount of yarn. I love this one. Uh, it's gorgeous inside and out. Um, and I am going to put both the information for cheeky ceramics and for my local yarn shop casting on. Um, you can message Kathy through her Facebook. Uh, I might have her email on there too, if you'd like a custom mug. But Sarah at Casting On has some of some mugs like this in stock that Kathy makes for her. So if you would like one more quickly, Sarah has agreed. You can email her, and um, she'll she'll hook you up. The second small business I would like to highlight is, and I'm gonna look this up because I don't know why for the life of me, I can't remember this business's full name. I always remember the second part. The second part is Opal. Um, but the first part, <laughs> the full name of the company is Scarlet and Opal. She is, or they are, I'm not real sure, a um, polymer clay earring. What? That's polymer clay. It's like sparkly and it looks a little like stone. She, she makes the coolest earrings. Um, I've ordered from her once. I definitely see myself ordering from her again. Maybe uh, what I need to do is I need to send this to my sister and I need to say like, pick me something out for my birthday because that would be fun because my sister knows me um, and what I like. And that would be fun. <laughs> so she, they, sorry, have an amazing array of earrings. They have some really casual ones. Like I consider these a little more on the casual side. Like they're not super dressy. Well, the other thing that's cool about them, let me show you both of them together. So um, you're either going to love this or you're going to hate it. So the two earrings are not identical. Do you see how they're similar but different? 
So, you know, the different colors, it's just kind of how they line up. So they're not like perfectly symmetrical, which I love. I love things that are like, in some things I like a lot of order, but in things like that, that are kind of more artistic, I love it when they're like just a little unique. So it's, it's like hand-dyed yarn, right? Like and they're not always perfectly symmetrical. Every skein isn't exactly the same. So these are like the hand-dyed yarn of earrings. But she has lots of great stuff from super fancy, like has taken custom orders for weddings and like all these like jewel things and earrings that are like iridescent and kind of like translucent gorgeousness so if you have need for that kind of stuff highly recommend for that I, I don't I don't do such fancy things anymore but then also some more kind of casual things um in lots of neat techniques and styles and shapes and just all the things so scarlet and opal I will put a link to the shop in the show notes so that you don't have to go searching for them. I, I'm hooking you up. Well, lots of hooking up. <laughs> Am I showing my age with that? Maybe? Is that what the cool kids are saying these days? I don't know. Probably not. Cannot wait to embarrass my kids with my old <laughs> sayings like that though, when they are old enough to know what the cool lingo is. They're not yet. Um, so you don't have to go searching. I want to make it easy for you to support these small businesses. So check out, uh, the show notes below, hit the more button, a whole bunch of stuff will come up. Um, and I will also link, this is, this yarn dyer is Creo, um, a Chicago yarn dyer, highly recommend, really beautiful, stunning hot pink, but then each of these, the like gray blue, and then this looks white, but it's actually like a really light gray, has speckles of some really just gorgeous color pops in it. So loved working with their yarn. Highly recommend. I will link that as well. Um, okay. Questions. Here we go. All right. So this first question is like a rollover from episode four. So if you haven't seen episode four, you can. It's You don't have to have seen it to understand what's going on. I'll kind of give like a little background. Uh, but if you want to see part one of this question, head back to episode number four. Um, we're going to talk about holding two yarns together. And so last week, the question was, what does, like if you hold two yarns together, what yarn weight does that then equal? And spoiler, the question was, or the answer was, it depends. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about yarn weights last week and like how holding them together affects um, the weight of the yarn. And, um, and I wanted to talk about why the heck you would hold two yarns together, but if I'm being real honest, my son had an appointment limited amount of time to film. So I was like, gotta go. <laughs> so, and the episode was plenty long. Um, I'm trying to keep these like real watchable. So I don't want to ramble on for hours and hours. Um, I don't know. I would love to know if length is something that's important to you. Like, do you want to keep these about 30 minutes or, um, or uh, should I just ramble on for as long as I have each week and just, it is what it is. Let me know in the comments below. And uh, thank you to Michelle for answering my question last week. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Shout out to Michelle who had all the words when I did not have the words. So if you didn't know the answer to my question last week, uh, check out the comments. Michelle knew. And I'm going to leave it with that. You got to go find out for yourself. <laughs> okay. So this week, I want to talk about why would you want to hold two yarns together? Because when I first started out holding two yarns, like when I first started out, the thought of holding two yarns together just complicated everything. And I do, mm, I didn't write this down, so I hope I remember. I do have some tips for when you're holding yarns together. They're like not a lot of tips, but <laughs> some things I've learned when I've done it in the past that um, are just a little helpful. And you know me, I love all the tips. So 
why would you hold two yarns together? I thought of three reasons you might hold two yarns together. And if you have more than this, share away. I'd love to know. Comment below. The first one is texture. So if a lot of yarns or some yarns that are really high texture are a very fine weight. So let's say mohair. Mohair. I'm looking at a skein of mohair and thinking I should have grabbed that. I'm just going to do it. It's right here. <sighs> okay. So mohair is very fuzzy. But let's see if I can get one, just one little. But if you look at just that one strand of it, it's very lightweight. So a lot of times, or sometimes, I guess I should say, personally, maybe I should say, I wouldn't want to make something that was just full mohair. Oh, which I should say, this is not actually mohair. It is baby surrey alpaca. Should read my yarn label. <laughs> and I'm wondering, do I have any mohair? I'm not as huge a fan of mohair. I find it uh, a little more itchy on my skin than uh, the baby surrey alpaca. And they give a similar uh, floof factor. Um, so if you wanted this floof, but you didn't want to um, create a whole project out of um, <laughs> such a fine yarn, you might hold two yarns together. The other thing is if you want like a sweater to make a whole sweater out of um, a lace weight yarn like this would take forever. <laughs> also, you might have a pattern that um, that calls, you know, there aren't a lot of, I don't know, I guess maybe I just don't look for them because I would never make a sweater out of lace weight yarn, but I assume there aren't a ton of um, lace weight um, sweater patterns out there. So you might say, I have this sweater pattern. It's calls for a sport weight. I want the floof factor. And so what I'm going to do is I have this um, baby surrey alpaca. I have a light or a fingering weight yarn and the two of them held together give me gauge for that sport weight sweater. And so to get this floofy texture, I'm going to hold them together. So that's one reason you might want to hold it together to get fuzz. The other thing is sheen. There are some yarns that have um, a really nice sheen to them. You might have something that has like a Stellina in it. I don't know if you can see this because it's um, the fuzz factor is great. But if you see like right in here, the core of this yarn is a silk. And you can see it's got a silk has a really nice sheen to it. So you might say, I would like a sweater that has like a little sheen or sparkle to it. And so you might hold a silk yarn along with another yarn to give that sheen. Or you might have a yarn that has a Stellina in it um, that is lighter weight than what the pattern calls for. But when you hold two yarns together, you can get that sparkle uh, with the yarn you already have. So texture is one reason people might hold two yarns together. Um, another reason is strength. Um, if you have something that you either are concerned about one of your yarns not being super strong, or you have an item that is going to be hard wearing like a sock, you may want to kind of reinforce a yarn with another yarn. So I have seen people hold a mohair um, just in the heel and the toe of a sock because uh, a lot of mohairs have a silk core and silk is super strong. And so you can kind of reinforce the heel and the toe of your sock by holding a um, something with more strength in it. The other thing that gives some strength is nylon. And so um, if you have a yarn you really want to use on a sock, but it doesn't have any nylon in it, you could maybe hold it with another yarn 
that has some nylon in it that would reinforce uh, and strengthen, strengthen, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, the other reason is color. So um, I have before had a pattern in mind and had a yarn that I really loved, but it wasn't the right weight for the pattern. So um, let's say you have a, uh, a DK weight sweater that you wanna make, but you have this yarn in a fingering weight that you love the color. And you go looking for a similar color to make the sweater in, but you just can't find anything. It's not satisfying, you're not satisfied. You're not. You you have this one that you love. You want it to be in the sweater, but it's not the right yarn weight. So you could work out that if you hold that finger, fingering weight double, you get you meet gauge of the DK weight sweater in a fabric that you love. So you might decide, I'm gonna hold these two together and or I'm gonna hold it double, and then I get the color that I want and the pattern that I want. So if you can't find the right color, that might be a reason to hold the yarn double. Um, marling, uh, it, uh, the marling effect of holding two different yarns together or even two like hand dyed yarns that uh, maybe uh, don't, like they aren't perfectly uniform, they're not a solid, they're maybe more of a tonal or um, they move in and out of colors a little more, gives a really neat, um, a really neat uh, effect. It can also give, holding two yarns together can give a real depth to the fabric. And then um, it can really, uh, holding another yarn with a yarn can really, together with another yarn, can really uh, affect the, the overall effect of the yarn. So it, you can brighten up a color that's maybe a little neutral or dull for your taste, or you can take a color <clears throat> that is really bold, uh, combine it with another color and kind of um, mute it a little bit and end up with a more subtle color that is really gorgeous. Um, Sarah, the owner of my local yarn shop did this. She had a sweater, she, uh, she held uh, a mohair and a, I think it was a fingering weight yarn together to knit this sweater and I'm not joking when I looked at the fingering weight yarn I was like oh I like that it's a neat it was kind of like a um oh I'm gonna get this wrong I really liked the color of the fingering and then she showed me the color of the um the mohair and I was like that's disgusting <laughs> I did not like the color of the mohair at all but she put them together in this sweater and oh my gosh you guys the two of them combined was gorgeous um the mohair kind of muted the yellows of i think the mohair was kind of like a brownish which you know isn't my favorite um and the the um fingering was more of a a yellowy color the way they faded in and out of each other just gave the fabric so much depth and so much texture. And the way the colors played together enhanced both of them to be better than they originally were. It ended up looking like almost like a kind of a tiger's eye, um, you know, the stone tiger's eye uh, effect in the sweater. It was amazing. So if you love to play with color and texture, Holding two yarns together can be a really great way to do that. Tips for holding two yarns together. It may seem incredibly tempting um, to, to say, okay, I have these two uh, hanks of yarn, or, or I don't, or they're just like balls of yarn, and you, you're like, I'm going to hold them together anyways. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wind them into one cake, and then they're all already together. And then I'll just pull from that cake and, and work them. That seems great in theory. I can tell you from having done it before, it, it's not great in practice. It's not. If 
the yarns, which typically, especially, I guess I should say, especially if you're holding two different yarns together, it might work better if they're the same yarn. Um, but they'll pull differently from the ball and then you'll end up with one that's like tighter and one that's looser and then they get wrapped around each other. And it's just, in my experience, a very tangled mess. Very tangled mess. So keep, keep them just separate on their own. It's fine. And pull from those. Um, yarn spindles are great for that. They're like a little lazy Susan with a spike on them and you set your cake onto the spike and then they just spin as you pull the yarn from them. That's super handy. If you're not that fancy though, um, just a basket or a large bowl. Um, you can stick your cakes in there and they can kind of roll around together. And if they twist around, it's not as big a deal though. You can always just like untwist them. Um, so do, I don't recommend caking them together. Uh, and then my last tip, so many of them, right? <laughs> my last tip is, uh, remember you need whatever two yarns you're holding together. You need the yardage of the original yarn of the project in both of those yarns. So let's say I, I think we did last time we talked about like a mohair having, I'm going to keep this real easy, 800 yards and a uh, fingering having 400 yards. Let's say you found this cute little, uh, sweater, short sleeve sweater, summer sweater that you're going to make. And the sweater in your size calls for, Ooh, let's keep it real easy. 1600 yards. Look at how smart I am. I feel so smart about this. Okay. So for 1600 yards, in the mohair that are 800 yards, you're gonna need two of them, right? <laughs> I can math. And for the fingering weight yarn, which has 400 yards per skein, you're gonna need four of them to get 1600 yards, right? So you're gonna need four of your fingering and two of your mohair. Also, if I was doubling the fingering, then I would need eight of the fingering, right? Because I need two, I need double that because I'm gonna hold them together. Um, I don't want you to like not think through that and then be like, oh look, I only had half as much yarn as I needed. Um, also, I would like to clarify, you should not cut it as close to yardage as having the exact number of yards recommended by the pattern. So let's pretend, let's just pretend that that, that sweater pattern was more like uh, 1500 yards because then you'll have an extra hundred yards of each of your yarns and that's playing it a lot more safe. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to lead you astray <laughs> and have you running out of yarn. Nothing stresses me out more. Well, I mean, that's not true. That's a bit dramatic, but it definitely stresses me out when I'm getting towards the end of a project and I'm like, will I have enough yarn? Will I have enough yarn? I don't know. It's very stressful. Okay. So let me show you some examples. I was like, what do I have laying around here where I've held two yarns together? And I found this guy. I will, oh, you know, if I was better, I would have looked this up ahead of time, but I didn't. I'll link the pattern below. This uh, is a fun pattern where I held two solid and very distinct yarns. So what you do, uh, yep. You start on this end, you hold two of the solid color together. Then you do this fun little detail where you uh, do like a little um, stranded color work where you, you know, do the yarns back and forth to get those little blocks. And then you switch to using one strand of holding one strand of the blue and one strand of the yellow. Now, if these colors had been, um, closer in tone. My, my two colors are very different. Um, it would have, uh, it wouldn't have marled differently, but it would have given a different effect. You can see I've got kind of some, some pooling down here where like you're seeing more of the blue, the teal in this part, a lot more of the yellow in this part. It, it mixed a little better in other places. Um, so then you come back up to the top and you do the stranded color work and then you switch to just two of the teal and that's how you get 
the same yarn weight throughout the whole pattern. Um, but then you get that marling in the middle is done by holding two yarns, two different yarns together. So much fun. Loved this pattern. It was like a great mix of um, simple and different, if you know what I mean. Um, I actually taught myself to knit it uh, in uh, a different way when I made this because it's all just knit, 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 knit. Um, I taught myself how to flick my yarn instead of like, doing the big wrap. So love this pattern. I'll link it before, before, below. Um, Vanessa Knits is the designer. I know that for sure. Okay. Then another, um, project, <laughs> goodness words, project where I held two yarns together is this sweater. Um, I, first of all, I, I adjusted this sweater a lot. This is the ranunculus sweater. Now, now I'm opposite. I don't remember who the designer is, but I know the name of the sweater. Um, and it's a big, huge boxy sweater and I made it, it's a fitted sweater on me. Um, and I, I had a yarn that I liked and then I, um, a yarn dyer, Hello Stella. I'm like, I know it's Stella something. Hello Stella did a knit along for this and I joined in because I very rightfully so said the only way that I'm going to um, make a sweater <laughs> is if I have a deadline. So she had a knit along and so I had a fingering weight yarn. I don't even remember what yarn it calls for. I think it calls for like maybe a fingering weight and a mohair. I'm pretty sure it calls for a mohair because I definitely remember being like, meh, I'm definitely not doing that. Um, so I had this yarn, um, which I believe is a Malabrigo. Um, and so I had this, that's the purple that's in here. But then I ordered this fingering weight yarn to go with it. So it's kind of that minty, tealy green, which actually is, I'm not a big mint person. That's not my favorite, but you can see there's, there's purples and blues and that, I don't know if you can tell that pink right there is really close to this purple. So they blended really nicely together. So these two yarns made this fabric held together. Isn't that fun? It's so fun. I love it. So you can see how they blend together. Um, and you can see the difference between yarns that share colors and how they look when held together and yarns that share no colors look when they're held together. It's a very different look. Um, so fun to play with. Highly recommend trying some swatching with two yarns held together. It's just fun, it's just fun. So then the other thing you can do is you can fade with yarns when you hold them together. So this is my uh, beginner Tunisian fade scarf and you can see this little section right in here i fade from the light color to the dark color and that is done by holding the two yarns together in different combinations so fading is another good reason to hold two yarns together so those are why you might want to do it um oh gosh you know i've been talking too long when my tablet shuts off <laughs> okay so I thought a good question to go along with why would you hold two yarns together like that is a question that I got a while back and had a great conversation actually in person uh, with uh, one of my students. And she was asking like, A, how do you fade? That was her first question it was like, how do you make a fade? And then, um, she was like, I've seen some cool projects that say like this, this fade or whatever. And she was like, but I don't really understand like, what is it and how do you achieve it? And I was like, those are great questions. And they go along so well with our, um, holding two yarns together because that's one of the answers. Um, so what is a fade? A fade is when, uh, you intentionally melt 
from one color to the next. So this is the antithesis of fading. Two separate colors. We go blue, we go white, we go blue, we go white, we go pink. Strong strikes. When you fade, you move slowly through colors um, so that they kind of meld and blend together, okay? They kind of melt into each other instead of being a strong stripe or delineation. So it's called a fade because of that melting looks like the colors. It looks like when you like um, dip dye something and it kind of ombres. Um, it's, it's that slow transition between the colors. It looks like they're fading. So how do you fade? And the answer to that is lots of ways. <laughs> and it depends on what pattern you have. And is, it in, an, an, is fade intended by the designer? If you are starting out, probably the easiest way to do a fade is to find a pattern where a fade is intended. And then the designer kind of, not kind of, the designer will guide you through those color transitions. Um, but you can really make any project into a fade. So let's first talk about um, ways, uh, I don't know that I want to say that. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some techniques for fading. You can fade by holding two yarns together. So that's how this is accomplished. You can see these colors are like both neutrals. But other than that, this is like super light, uh, oh my gosh, wheat kind of color. And this is like a taupey brown. They are, they're both solid colors. They're, they're not uh, close to each other. They're not like right next to each other. And so this fade is achieved by holding the two yarns together in various combinations to slowly shift. So one way you can create a fade is by working with two yarns together. I'm pretty sure <clears throat> that Sandra Gutierrez of Nomad Stitches has a sweater pattern where she fades in that same technique. You hold two yarns together and then she tells you hold this yarn first then hold this yarn and this yarn and you know we'll take you through how you hold the different yarns together to create the fade of of the sweater um another way is to um work with yarns that are meant to fade um or that you pick out that fade nicely together. So some yarn dyers intentionally dye fades, but you can also go into a yarn store and, and pick out yarns that naturally kind of melt and transition through colors in a more subtle way and create your own fade. I'm going to give you some tips on that in a little bit. So it can be, the work can be done by the yarn um, and picking yarn that is really close in color. And uh, the other thing is you can use fabric techniques that a facilitate a fade. You can uh, stripe kind of back and forth between the colors to kind of transition them. Um, you can um, work stitches that kind of dip back down into the other colors. And so that kind of like eases the transition between colors. So there are fabric techniques. So choosing yarn for a fade. I'm gonna try to make this kind of quick because I've, I've rambled on a lot. So. Choosing yarn for a fade. One way to do it, and probably the easiest way to do it, is to find a yarn dyer who has intentionally made a fade. And some of them will intentionally, or a lot of them actually, will intentionally make fades for specific patterns. So I know that um, Andrea Mowry of Drea Ray Knits had, Drea Rene Knits, bleh, um, <laughs> has several patterns that fade. And actually you heard um, Tanya and I talking about it in her Meet the Maker, um, if you watch that one. So we talked a little bit about, a bit about fades. So some yarn dyers will dye kits specifically made for patterns that are meant to fade. And the yarn dyer does the work of transitioning the yarns so that they um, will kind of melt into each other. Now I, so I have an example here. This is actually from Tanya and the, she dyed these specifically to, you know, transition 
from one to the other. So you can see the purple has lots of nice deep purple tones. The middle one transitions you from the purple tones to more of the blue and the teal. And then this last uh, skein has the teal, but then also a darker blue. So you can work a pattern that's meant to fade and just transition from the purple to the blue and purple to the blue. This kit, or these three yarns, were specifically made to fade, dyed to fade into each other. They're all from Tanya of Cornbread and Honey. Uh, I bought this years ago, so she doesn't have this exact one, but I know I'm mostly positive she has some kits if you want to do that. Um, and so you can go with one that a yarn dyer has specifically dyed to transition like that. Um, you can also pick up a gradient ball of yarn, and that is just a ball that, ha that was made, created, to slowly transition between colors. Now you need to um, pay a little attention to these because some of them are, are stripes, like they're hard transitions between the colors. If you look at this skein carefully, you can see that it's not hard transitions. You've got the black and then it mixes some black with the purple and then some purple with the blue and some purple with the tealy green and they slowly transition between the colors. And so this is a way you can get a fade with no work. The trick about this guy though, the, the ball that is the gradient is, <laughs> it's supposed to be there. Um, is that um, they transition when they transition. You can't choose. So if I were to make a shawl with this, like I could remake my poppy shawl with this and never cut the yarn, just crochet it from beginning to end and it would slowly transition through the colors. Um, but I wouldn't choose where the transitions happen. If you want to cut into a gradient ball like this, you can manipulate it some, um, but it's, it's a challenge. So that's one option, but it does limit you somewhat to where the transitions happen. When you do a, a fade set like this, you choose when you dip into, or the pattern will tell you, when you dip into the next skein, and, and that's how you'll transition the colors. And then it'll work up with the transitions in the same place as the pattern. All right, uh, my last way that you can um, fade is to make your own. You can go into your stash, go partly into your stash and partly to the yarn shop and pick colors that fade. How do you do that? It's a deeper topic and I've been talking for a while, but a couple suggestions are speckles are great for fades because they can pull in colors as you transition across colors uh, into the different yarns. You can, you know, they all have the same kind of speckle that gives some unity to it. Um, I think the easiest way is to choose a fade from one yarn dyer because you know that that teal in that one, the speckle there is almost, if it looks very similar, it's probably the same dye because it was from the same dyer that speckled the other one. So easier for colors to melt and mend, mend, <laughs> melt and blend because they're coming from probably the same dye because it's the same dyer. Um, but you can um, do it from a bunch of different dyers at your yarn shop. Um, if it's okay with the yarn shop owner, a great way to tell how they might transition is to open up the uh, hanks and so that you can see all of the colors in the whole hank. It's harder to do that when they're twisted um, and hanked up. The other thing is you can kind of like unhank them and wrap them around each other and you can get kind of an idea of like, as these blend together, is it a harder line? or is it softer? And the softer the transition, the more gentle your fade will be. So if you have any questions about that, I would love to know. Um, you can either 
leave me a question in the comments below. Have you faded before? Do you love a fade? Did you do it on your own? Did you do a pattern that specifically called for a fade? If you have a pattern that specifically calls for a fade, uh, drop it in the comments. We would love to check it out. <laughs> but you can fade any pattern you want. Like I said, I could take my poppy shawl and just do it in a fade and it would look totally different. Uh, it wouldn't be stripes. Uh, in the yarn colors, but but you can absolutely do that. Be adventurous. Give things a try. Have fun. Play. I mean, worst case scenario, you tear it back and use the yarn for something else, right? That's the joy of knitting and crocheting. You can always tear it back and, and reuse your supplies, which I love. Thank you so much for joining me today. I uh, if If you have hung on this long, I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day and, and get out in the sunshine. Enjoy the sun on your face and breathe some fresh air and happy crafting.